What is a party? It's sharing a meal with your friends. It's celebrating good news with your family. It's opening up to people you've never met before. Jesus is the life of the party. To him, parties are more than just gatherings. They're an opportunity to grow deeper in the art of being together. He wasn't afraid to party. He partied with the rich and the poor, the devout and the sinners. And at every party, he brought something unexpected. Good morning, Cross Points. Good morning. Hope you all are having a great Sunday so far. We've got a lot in store for you um, tonight at 6.30. I know it might sound crazy, but we're going to have a party at the pool. Not very many of you sound very excited about that. Hey, I have 11-year-old kids. They're excited about the pool tonight, let me tell you. Uh, we want to encourage you. We're going to have a great time. Uh, 6.30 tonight at the Shawnee Pool uh, at that Johnson Drive in Flum. It's free. We're going to have food and music and lots of stuff to drink. And it's just going to be a lot of fun. So even if you don't get in the pool, I know it just rained last night and it's a little chillier. It's not 90 degrees and sunny. But we're still going to have a great time. And I want to encourage you to come on out for that. We're going to have a blast uh, as we uh, just kind of enjoy one another's company. Uh, let's see. What else do I want to communicate? Also, I wanted to say that our teens are back from France. Can we give it up for our young people? They've done such a phenomenal job and all of our leaders that were there as well. They did a really great job, so I'm super proud of them. I'm just so glad to be a part of a church where we send out young people to like go preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Like We're not struggling with them with all kinds of the issues of the world, but man, they want to be on the front line serving Jesus. Isn't that? That's a great thing. You all should be proud of our young people that they're doing such an amazing job. And we are really blessed as a congregation. Um, how many of you are here? I ask this question every Sunday. And uh, I want to know how many of you are here because you want to have God speak to you. You want him to communicate to you. That's why you're here. You've come for something for God to download something into your heart, your spirit. Keep your hands up because I want to pray for you because I believe God's got a word for you. Father, you see all these hands that are lifted high. And they're signifying with their hands raised that they want to hear from you. And so, Father, I pray that you would be faithful to them, that you would speak to them, that you would whisper to them, that you would use my words. Go beyond what I have to say. Father, would you speak to them, minister to them. May they have an understanding of what it is that you have for them. And, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we wouldn't just hear, but we would hear and obey. That we would walk out what it is that you speak to us today. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen, amen. All right, well, I did this last week, and it's been resonating in my spirit. And I hope you guys are ready, because I'm pretty jazzed, and I went really late the first service, so, but... I'm going to condense it, but I'm, but I'm really excited, and I want you to be excited because I believe that God is awesome, and we oftentimes forget and lose sight of how amazing God is. Like, we don't talk about his goodness enough. Okay, I'm going to want some amens today, okay? I need you to amen me today, all right? You have my permission to say amen and to shout me down, okay? God is amazing, and sometimes as a church, we forget that. We get so lost in the busyness of the world. We get so lost in the decisions and the heartache and the pain of this world that we forget that God is so good. And today, I want to encourage you that God is good, and I want to roll through with you some things that, that I hope will seep into your spirits about how good God is. That I want you to know that he's the anchor of your soul. That, like when things get crazy and chaotic, God anchors you to his word. That he's there for you when the world is topsy-turvy. And how many of you know the world is topsy-turvy out there? Like we are living in some crazy, messed up times, right? 
But God is the anchor of our souls. That he's our burden bearer. Like when, when you feel discouraged and feel all the pressure and the weight of the world, whether that's jobs or whatever it is, God is your burden bearer. He's the one that wants to lift your burden. He's your counselor when you don't know where to go and what to know. God wants to speak to you and whisper to you, hey, this is the way. Walk in it. This is what God has for you. That he's the door to life. That he's eternal. That he will never change. That he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. This is the God that you serve today. That he's good. That he's holy. That he's distinct and set apart. That he is awesome in nature did you know that he ever lives to intercede on your behalf that right now jesus is at the right hand of the father talking about you because he loves you that much this is how much god loves you and i don't want you to forget it as a church that he is just and good that he's the king of kings and the lord of lords can i get an amen he's the king of kings and lord of lords that he's filled with love it's who he is it's part of his nature did you know that That God can't be anything else than love because that's who he is. And he's so much more than that. That he's merciful. Did you know that God wants to be merciful to you today? I don't know where you found yourself today. I don't know if you've straggled in or or maybe you're on the periphery of life. And maybe you've just kind of wandered in today and, and you feel far from God. I want you to know today that God wants to be merciful to you. That he's so excited that you're here. He's so impressed that you decided to come, that you want to have a deeper relationship with him, that God wants to show mercy to you. He doesn't want to put you down. He doesn't want to condemn you. Today, God wants to set you free. Did you know that? That God never fails. Did you know that? He never, ever fails. This is important for us to understand that he knows everything, that he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful. This is the God that you serve. Did you know that he's your rock this morning? That he's your rock. He's the sure foundation on which you can stand. When the world is going crazy, you can say, I can stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. He's the one in whom I can put my hope and trust. Did you know that? And he is the way, the truth, and the life. Did you know that God is sovereign? That he never, ever changes? That he is good? That's part of his nature? That he, oh man, did you know that he's the living water? That he satisfies you and quenches your soul like no one else can? That money can't buy you happiness? That money can't please you? But I can tell you what, the Spirit of God, when he comes into your life, he will make you feel satisfied and give you that drink of water that will bubble up within you and through you and overflow into your life. Did you know that? And finally, did you know that God is zealous for you? He's zealously in love with you, that he wants to pursue you. And so many of you, God is chasing after, that he wants you to be close to him, that he wants you to have fellowship with him. Like he created you, he formed you, he fashioned you. Because he wants to have relationship with you, he loves you that much. This is the God that we serve. He's full of love and joy and mercy and kindness and peace. All of these are what we call the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know this, that not only is God awesome, but that awesome lives inside of you if you've given your life to Jesus Christ. That awesome nature of who God is lives inside of you. It's a crazy thing. Theologians have been trying to put their hands around how to define and quantify that. But when Jesus told his disciples that it's better for me to go away to my father than it is for me to remain here with you. Did you know he said that? And the reason why he said that and the disciples got all discouraged and worried and frustrated because like you can't leave us Jesus. And Jesus said, it's better for me to go away because I'm going to send my spirit. He's not just going to be with you. He's going to be in you. Now, that's something to get excited about because that means all of God's awesome characteristics, his fruit, all of the goodness and the mercy, God wants to display through your life. That you can accept. I don't think some of you believe that. You read it, John 13, 14, 15, and 16, Jesus talks all about it, that we, if we've given our lives to Jesus, if we surrender ourselves to him, if we fully accept who God is, and we say, Jesus, without you, I'm nothing, that I'm going to turn from my old ways and I'm going to walk with you, that his spirit comes and dwells inside of us. 
It's a powerful, powerful understanding. And I want you guys not just to sit there and read an old, dusty book. I want you to live out the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And sometimes we get so stayed in kind of our theologies that we, that we lose sight of all of the goodness that God is. Now let me tell you this. I grew up as a, as a church kid. Uh, my mom and dad, and, uh, they, uh, they were kind of hippies back in the day, and they got saved, radically transformed. And as a result of their decision, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, I went to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. We had group in our home. And I remember just like uh, growing up as a young person, hearing all the wonderful things that Jesus did. As we open up the pages of scripture, um, I remember just reading and understanding and kind of picturing in my mind Jesus healing those that were blind and that they could see for the very first time. And Jesus healing those with leprosy and they were outcasts and strangers and Jesus touched them and they were completely completely and totally healed and brought into the family of God. This is what God does for each one of us. He opens our eyes. He, he makes us clean and brings us into his family. And as a young person, I remember these things. And, 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 I, and I remember just kind of as a young person growing up, learning all of these things. And, and the older I got, the more I learned. That might be the case with some of you that you've been a believer maybe for a while and you learn over the years and your understanding gets deeper and and you learn all of these kind of what I call theologies theologies uh, the study of God in relation to whatever it might be and and I learned about soteriology and that's the that's the the theology of salvation and and we talk about the holy spirit and that's pneumatology and 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 we can talk about all these kind of things these these deeper things that kind of take us you know deeper into the experiences of who God is but but one thing I didn't learn as this young person as I was growing up into this Christian environment I was kind of the good kid I was the goody two-shoes do I have any goody two-shoes out there you just grew up and you were just kind of the good kid you never really kind of wandered off the path that was me I'm sorry I was just a nerd that way and and I didn't have a ton of friends growing up and that's okay I'm fine with that and I always kind of kind of separated myself from other people because I just I, I was a little introverted at that point in my life and 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 I was just this good kid I was this good kid and I learned all these great things about God and, and all these fantastic things. But I tell you what, I missed out on one key theology when it comes to Scripture. And I want to tell you what it is today. It's called party theology. I Yeah, that's right. You heard it right. Party theology. I missed out on party theology. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Jesus loved parties. He went to all kinds of parties. He hung out with people that you weren't supposed to hang out with. And Jesus ate a lot. Like if you read through the pages of Scripture like many of us did in February, we went through the entire New Testament together. If you look through the pages of the New Testament, you're going to discover that Jesus is eating all the time. Like he's eating with people. And if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to eat all the time. And you're going to be around people all the time. And that might make you a little bit fearful this morning. But I want you to know if you're going to be like Jesus, you're going to eat a lot. And one pastor said this, if you're going to eat a lot, but you don't walk like Jesus, you're going to end up like Buddha. You need to eat like Jesus and walk like Jesus. And I want to tell you, this party theology is so important. It's so important that a lot of theologians don't talk about it because, well, it's not the cultural thing to talk about. It's not the deep, serious thing. But I want to tell you that Jesus, when he walked this earth, parties were deeply important to him. Because parties were where people were. And Jesus loved people. And what I found as a young person and growing up in the Christian church is that we say no to parties. Because that's where, that's where bad things happen. That's where we're not supposed to be. But Jesus, if we look through the pages of Scripture, he flips that. Here's the thing. Jesus is awesome. 
And he took his awesome nature, his self, all that who he is, his kindness, his goodness, his love, his mercy, his grace, and he took that with him to the parties, to the people that didn't deserve it, to the people that were far from God. But he took his nature into those parties. And so it is with us that God is awesome, and awesome lives in you, and God is calling you to a party theology where you step into the world that so desperately needs God's goodness. Can I get an amen? Because I'm preaching as hard as I can for you guys. Yeah. So Jesus goes to all these parties. John, uh, the disciple John, the apostle John, is writing his gospel. And we believe he's in his 90s. He's at the latter end of his life. And he begins to compose his gospel. It's the gospel of John. And, and he begins to recount, and I'm thinking in my, in my mind that as John is writing his Gospels, he's re- remembering all the stories of Jesus, all the healings, all the miracles, all the things that Jesus did. And he begins to write his story. And the very first thing that he talks about with regards to Jesus coming onto the scene, we're going to find in John chapter 2, where we're going to discover that this morning. So in John chapter 2... It says that the next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus' disciples were also invited to the celebration. Now I want you to know this. John, he begins the story of Jesus at a party. A wedding at the time of Jesus was a huge celebration. It could have been lasted as, as long as seven days, at least three or four days, depending on how wealthy you were. Parties, a wedding party would go on for almost a week, and they would eat and drink and dance and laugh and have fun, and it was a joyous festival. And what I find fascinating from, from this, this opening scripture montage that John begins to relate, he wants you to understand that Jesus is invited to the party. And Jesus doesn't just receive an invitation, Jesus attends the party. Oftentimes, for believers in Jesus, especially the longer you've been a believer, we tend to insulate ourselves. We don't go to the parties anymore because you're not supposed to go to those parties. All your life you've been told, don't do this and don't do that and don't go here. But Jesus, he responds by going to a party. It's one of the first things that he does. I want you to know today, I want you to go to the party. I don't want you to be insulated. And and I'm preaching hard on this because this really is kind of coming out of my spirit as we begin to launch churches. I want this church out of the four walls of the church. I want us to be like Jesus. I want us to begin to engage in the culture around us. And it's easy for us to say no to the party because that's where all the bad stuff happens. It's easy for us as Christians to say, you know what, my community is here and the world's community is there and there's a line and I'm not going to cross at it. In fact, I'm going to yell at that across that line and tell them how wrong they are. Jesus didn't do that. You see, Jesus walked across the line, took his awesomeness with him, all the goodness and the mercy and the grace and the kindness, and he brought it to people who desperately needed it. You see, awesome lives in you. And I want you to start going to parties. I want you to start having parties at your house. And you're going to be uncomfortable, and I'm going to be excited about that. I can't wait for you to begin to tell me about how uncomfortable you are with people that are different than you, that think differently than you. Because Jesus calls us to go into places that are just a little bit uncomfortable. As this story continues, we find that at this wedding celebration, this amazing, wonderful event, that they run out of wine. And wine was really critical at this point. And and we find from the pages of Scripture that, that they've run out, and so there's a panic Somehow Jesus' mother is, is involved in this, and, and she comes to Jesus, and she says, listen, they've run out of wine. 
which, which are really dire circumstances because at that point the, the, the bride and the groom could be sued because everybody that came to the party came with gifts, financial gifts, in order to have this party last for so long. And when you run out of, run out of the wine, it could be that you maybe embezzled some of those funds and didn't provide for everyone like you needed to. And so it was a really serious issue. And for some reason, they run out of wine. And Mary looks at the servants who are waiting on the whole wedding party, and she looks at Jesus and she says, well, just do, just do whatever he tells you to do. And so they find this serious situation in the midst of this lavish, amazing, wonderful party. And we find as the story continues in John chapter 2, it says that now there were six stone water jars. And they were there for the Jewish rites of purification. And each of them held about 20 or 30 gallons. Now, I want to stop there just for a second. These are huge jars. They're stone jars. And we don't know exactly how tall they are, but they have to at least hold 20 or 30 gallons each. And these stone jars are really important in the life of a Jew. And every Jew knew about these jars. These jars were for the purification rites. Uh, Moses, when he brought the children into the promised land, and, and while he was re- receiving instruction from God, there were certain things that they had to uh, cleanse themselves of, and there were purification rites. Now, the, the leaders of the Jewish people, after Moses passes on uh, from one generation to the next, they begin to kind of put more laws and more burdens and more regulations about these washings so that the washings kind of got out of hand. Uh, uh, they, they literally had to not wash their hands for hygienic purposes, but they washed their hands for the purpose of understanding that they were separated from God, that they weren't holy. And so every morning when they woke up, the rule was, this wasn't from God, but this was their own ordained rules from their elders and leaders, was that every morning when you got up, you had to wash your hands three times. That before you ate a meal, again, not for cleansing hygienic purposes, but to recognize that you're not holy. Three times, pour the water over, wash your hands. Whenever you were engaged in in maybe a funeral or something like that, same kind of thing. So these stone jars held 20 to 30 gallons each of water. And they're there at the wedding, and so they're eating and drinking. And, of course, this water is really important. And Jesus says, I want you to fill the jars with water. And so this water is not pure, clean drinking water. This is what we would call non-potable water. Have you ever been in a campsite and you have that non-potable water? It's the water that you kind of wash your hands with or do dish or whatever it is, but you don't drink it. You don't consume it. It's for other purposes. Well, this is that kind of water. And as we continue on with the story, it says that when the jars had been filled, Jesus said, now dip some out and Take it to the master of ceremonies. This is non-purified water that they're dipping out. And so it says that the servants in follow, followed his instructions. And when the master of ceremonies had tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. And then when everyone has had a lot to drink, when they're feeling a little bit tipsy, when they don't really know what they're, that's when he brings out the less expensive wine. But you, you've kept the best until now. This guy is overwhelmed. He doesn't know what's going on. The servants do. The disciples do. They recognize that there was non-potable, really kind of gross kind of water. Who knows where they got it from? It was just really just a kind of a purification, right? And Jesus, he speaks to it, and he turns the water into wine. Now, something significant is happening. It's not just Jesus turning water into wine. Jesus is displaying his glory for, for a moment. And we get a picture of it in John chapter 1. It says that, For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love came through Jesus Christ. Jesus is painting a picture here. And I want you to know this, that Moses turned the water of the Nile into blood. But Jesus turned the water into wine of joy. See, Moses had this water that was turned into blood, that was condemnation, that was just that was that was saying to the to the children of Israel and to the Egyptians, you're separated from God, and you deserve judgment and you deserve death. 
But Jesus, he flips it around and he says, listen, I'm turning this water into wine because I want you to know that I'm giving my life for the world so that I will die, that you don't have to die, so that you can experience joy and peace and love and kindness and mercy. Can I get an amen? And faithfulness and greatness and goodness. This is all that God has for you. And I and, and, and I'm so excited today because I want us to understand that God is awesome and that his awesome spirit lives within us. And I don't want you just to come on a Sunday morning and sit and just kind of receive. I want you to walk into places that make you a little bit uncomfortable. I want you to understand party theology. I want you uh, if I could say it this way, I want you to bring the party to the party. I want you to be intentional. Jesus brought the wine to the party. The joy, the celebration had stopped. The nervousness, the worry, the doubt, the concern, all of this was enveloped with the crowd that was there. But Jesus, he steps in and he brings the party to the party. He brings the party to a whole nother level. And you're called to do the same thing. But oftentimes, what happens is that we say no. And I'm guilty of it. And I, I, I want to change. I'm, I'm your pastor, and I'm saying the same thing. I'm, I don't know about you, but sometimes we get invited to block parties, or we get invited to after-work parties, or we get invited to whatever. And, and the default for me is kind of like, no, I'm kind of busy. I got other things that I really don't want to hang out with you. Let's be honest. And see, we can get deeper in God, and that's good and wonderful, and I'm not disparaging all those things, but if we miss the other side of party theology, we really miss why God came in the first place. That he came for us to step into a party, to come with intention. He didn't come for you to be influenced by the world. He wants you to influence the world. And so we come with intention that when we say yes to a party, we say, God, would you speak through me? Would you communicate through me? God, I, I'm not necessarily there to get somebody to, to get on their knees and pray and receive you. I just want to be a blessing to the party. I want to bring your joy and your hope and your goodness to a place that desperately needs it. They need you at the party. Did you know that? As believers in Jesus, if you're a believer in Jesus, they need you at the party. They need you there so that you can point the way. You may never say a word about Jesus, but your life and your expectation and your attitude and your peace and all of the things that God does in your life, the world needs that. Like they need to see that you're pointing them to the way and the truth and the life because awesome lives in you. As we conclude this story, John writes this kind of closing paragraph, and, and this is what he says. He says, this miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus reveals his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now, take this not some theological perspective. I want you to take it at face value. Jesus reveals his glory at a party. Jesus reveals his glory by giving a whole bunch of people a whole lot of wine. And not just grape juice, he's giving them wine to enjoy. When we come to a party, let's be intentional. Let's have influence. Let's bring gifts to the party that are unexpected. Don't be the downer. Don't be the, 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 the classic goody two-shoe that says, no, I can't associate with you. I hope you guys are getting this. Because I want to see a culture change at cross points. I want us to see getting out there. You know, let me tell you this. So many people in our culture, they'll go to a rock concert. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll go to a sporting game. And, and some of you are like them. I know because I talk to you, and I see some of your Facebook posts. I see your Instagram. I know where you're at. 
And some of you guys, you're going to these events and these games, and, and you're, you're the first to yell and to scream and to shout and get excited. And you're at the concert. You got your phone up. You know what I'm talking about. And you're waving your hands in the air, and you're doing this. And I'm like, can we not get excited about Jesus? Can we not point the world to him? Can we not tell the world that he's changed our lives? And you don't have to do that by condemning them. You don't have to tell them how bad they are. Can you just tell them how good God is? You see, it was the Pharisees that said, you're not doing it right. You're doing it wrong. You, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be hanging out with them. Jesus, you're going to ruin your reputation. And his reputation was ruined because did you hear what, who Jesus talked to last week? He talked to that lady that had five husbands. Can you believe that? And she's not even married right now. You see, that Pharisee attitude is going to say, don't ruin your stellar reputation. And I'll tell you this, Jesus, he stepped across that line. He didn't care about his reputation. There was only one person that he, he the, the only one person that mattered to him, and that was his father. He said, I'm only going to do those things that please my father. So you don't worry about what, what everybody else thinks. You go and, and, and I don't want you to be insulated. I want you to go with intention. I want you to go with joy. I want you to step across the line. Be in places that make you just a little bit uncomfortable. Be with the people that just seem a little bit, that, that make you just a little bit unnerved. Because I promise you this, I want you to be the life of the party. And the result is going to be that you're going to have influence. Now, let me say this, just, just from the outset as I close here. Some of you, I, I know what you're thinking. You're, you're like, Pastor David, I am not a party person. I am not an extrovert. When I think about people, I get hot sweat and flashes. I just, I can't be around people. I don't know what to say. I get awkward. I, 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 my tongue gets tied. I want to be in the corner. I want to hide. Anybody out there like that? Any introverts? It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. Good. How many of you, like, like you get, like, energized by, like, being alone, right? It's like not being around people, right? Well, I think it's interesting that Jesus at this party, he's not the center of attention. Quietly behind the scenes, he turns the water into wine. Quietly, he instills joy into a crowd and they don't even know where it comes from. Some of you, you might be introverted, but I'm telling you what, if you just show up at a party I promise you, God is going to use you if you go with intention. You may only talk to one person, and you may feel like you're like the most tongue-tied, awkward person, but I promise you, if you go with intention, uh, with, with the thought that, God, I want to be used by you just to, just to bring your joy and your love and your grace, I promise you, even one person might be changed as a result of what you do. And others of you that are kind of like me, look, I, I love a party. My staff knows it. Bigger, the better. I want more people. I get energized by being around people. You need to start having parties at your house. You need to start inviting people to your home that are different than you. Listen, listen, I, there are some of you that you've been believers so long, if you were to look back on your life when you were that party animal years ago, you might look back on that and go, man, if I was doing it, I would never invite myself to when I was 30 years ago. <laughs> like, that's... I want you to invite that kind of person that you used to be to your house. And if you don't know them, you better find them. We need to find those people. That's why I'm encouraging all of us to get out of the four walls of the church. That's why we're planting churches. That's why we send missionaries. That's why we send our young people. Because we're not called to be in our little enclave so that it can all be about us. We're called to cross the line to bring God's goodness to a world that desperately needs it. Amen. If you're here today, I want to speak this message to you. You may be far from God today, and I want you to know you found the right place. That God loves you so much that he died for you. That he wants to take the, that non-potable water, that dirty water inside of you, and he wants to turn it into wine. With, with his blood, he died on the cross for you so that you can have full relationship with him. I'm so glad you're here because God wants to come into your life today and make everything new and beautiful, awesome, 
wants to come and live inside of you. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me this morning? That may be you. Maybe I'm speaking to you. And you've wandered away from God. Today, I want you to know, today is the day for you to come to know Jesus, to have full relationship with him, to experience his goodness and his mercy and his grace. And in just a second, I'm going to have you raise your hand if you want to receive Christ in your life. And it's your way of signifying by raising your hand that, yeah, Pastor David, I need Jesus. I've done it in my own way, but, man, I, I need God. I want his awesomeness to come into my life because I've done life on my own and it hasn't turned out so well. If that's you this morning, just right now, would you just lift up your hands? I'm going to pray for you right where you are, and God's going to come into your life. I see that hand. I see that hand back there. Anyone else that would say, yeah, I need Jesus? Just lift your hand. I see that hand right there, too. Anyone else that would say, yeah, I need Jesus? Amen. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Amen. Amen. I see that hand, too. Amen. And we're going to pray as a church. And just keep your eyes closed and your head bowed. The whole church is going to pray with you. Just make this your own prayer of dependence upon God. Say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I want to turn from my old ways. I want to turn from my sin. And I want to turn towards you. I believe you rose from the grave to give me new life. Now fill me with your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just pray right now that your Holy Spirit would come upon those who raise their hands, that you would turn the water of their life into wine, that you would fill them with joy and purpose and peace and meaning. God, that you would do it right now by the power of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, God, for your goodness. As you keep our eyes closed, there may be some of you here today that you're like, yeah, I need to step into this party theology. I want to pray for you. Maybe you're a little bit nervous. Maybe you're a little bit introverted. Maybe you're extroverted, but you've been saying no to the party today. I want to pray for you that you would begin to say yes. And maybe that's you. You've been saying no, but now you recognize you need to say yes. Would you just raise your hand as we keep our eyes closed? I want to pray for you. I see those hands. I see those hands. Yeah, I see that hand back there. Yeah. God, I just pray for those that have their hands up that they're acknowledging that they need to begin to say yes. Lord, I pray that we would step outside of ourselves, that we would cross the line. God, that we would begin to display your goodness and your glory to a world that desperately needs it. Lord, help us. Lord, speak to us. Lord, speak through us. God, release Lord, your anointing in our lives. I pray that we would be people that would be known as the joyful people, (laughs) as the people that have experienced your goodness and that we want to share that with the world. So God, bless us to be a blessing. In Jesus' name, and the church said, amen.